Okay, welcome to understanding the residential purchase contract. I will be going over uh, the current version. My name is Peggy Wright, by the way, I'm the broker of the Keller Williams office. So we're gonna start with the acknowledgement and confirmation of disclosures page. Now the acknowledgement and confirmation of disclosures page is not required by the real estate commission. If you have all of the other documentation in place and you have another means of reporting whether you are working with an agent within the same brokerage, we do not, so we use this one. That is why you're gonna notice in the bottom right-hand corner, it says page one of one. It's not actually part of the initial residential purchase contract. So let's go over the major components of this page because we will be requiring this on all of our transactions. You notice that the yellow arrow is pointing to the word prior, which means you need to take care of these items before you allow your client to enter into a contract. So you're going to, where it says prior to entering into the contract of sale, put in the address of the property that they will be writing an offer on. And then the buyer is going to acknowledge and confirm. In the real estate world, acknowledging and confirm means not only did I see it, but I signed it. So if you have an acknowledgement and confirmation of disclosures uh, page with any of the documents that we're about to talk to talk about, and your client has not officially signed those documents, you need to get those done before they enter into a contract. So what is it your buyer is going to acknowledge and confirm that they have received? The very first thing that this document talks about is the duties and responsibilities page. Now this will be required at your earliest time. If you meet with a buyer and you're doing a buyer brokerage agreement, you could have it signed at that time, but no later than before you're about to write an offer for purchase with them. Now, if you're in my class, that would be page eight on the handouts that I will give out. If you're doing this via Zoom or watching this on YouTube, that document's going to look like this. Disclosure to seller and, or buyer of duties and responsibilities. You will check mark the appropriate box on how you represent them. You either have a buyer brokerage agreement with them or you're just simply writing a sales agreement with them. The listing side of this document is incorporated in the listing agreement, so you will not need this separate piece of paper. And then it goes on to talk about all your duties and responsibilities page, and you will notice at the bottom that the buyer has a um, capability of signing, so print their name, they'll sign out the side, and then you are finished with that document. You're going to notice that this document has a box here and a box here. So both of those indicate that this is applicable for in-house transactions only. And this is where the buyer is going to acknowledge and confirm that they understand that the broker is providing brokerage services to both parties. So if you are the listing agent and you also represent the buyer, you will check mark this box. If you represent the buyer, but someone from inside your brokerage, your particular office represents the seller, you will also check mark that box. So again, just to reiterate that, if you represent both sides, check the box. If you are doing a cross sale with someone from your office, not the same franchise, but from the same office, then check mark the box. Now we're gonna move into this section, really important. Buyer is going to be acknowledging that they have received some type of disclosure from the seller. So we're going to talk about what type of disclosure that they could have received and reviewed from the seller. They are either going to get a three page disclosure. You will know it is a disclosure from the seller because it's three pages long and has lots of boxes on it. Yes, it's working. No, it's not working. I don't know if it's working. If that is the document they received, then check mark the first box. If they are getting a disclaimer, which says, I have never lived in the property, I have no actual knowledge of the property, then you're gonna check mark box number two. If this transaction is exempt from disclosures, if it is a bank owned property, um, typically you will use this document if it's a bank owned property or if it's a brand new build and no one's ever lived in it before, then you will check mark box number three. If this transaction that you're writing an offer on does not have a structure on it, there is no residence, or it is a commercial property, 
then it will not need a disclosure, nor will it have one. So check mark the fourth box. Now we're going to talk about this section. This is the uh, lead-based paint disclosure section. Now, if a property was built uh, in 1978 or after, it will not be required to have a lead-based paint disclosure. So you will check mark the appropriate box for that. If you're check marking box number one, it means the seller completed a lead-based paint because it was the house was built before 1978. The buyers have seen it. The buyers have signed it. You've also given them the pamphlet on lead-based paint so they understand how to protect their family. I do recommend that you email that to your buyer and not print it. It is many, many pages long and it is full color. So just make sure that you are emailing that over to your client so they understand the hazards of lead-based paint. If the property was constructed after 1978 and it doesn't need a lead-based paint disclosure, then I want you to check mark the second box and then if the property is not a uh, residence, um, it's land or it's commercial property, you will not need a lead-based paint disclosure. So check mark the third box. Now, what else is your buyer acknowledging and confirming? They are acknowledging and confirming that you provided them with a estimate of cost. What is it gonna cost them outside of just the purchase price? to uh, purchase this property. So this will include all of their closing cost. So their purchase price plus, plus their closing cost. This can be used either, you can do a paper version of this or you can use one of the title or lender apps. Uh, I don't care which one it is, as long as you get it done and that you are aware what numbers need to go in it. But please make sure that you are completing that before they make an offer on the property. So we've already done multiple things here and we haven't even started writing the offer yet. So very first thing is you had them sign this disclosure of duties page. The second thing you did was show them the property disclosures provided by the seller and they have signed those property disclosures. Third is if a lead-based paint uh, disclosure was provided, they have also seen it, they have also signed it. And then the fourth thing is you gave them an estimate of cost. Now we're ready to write the offer for the buyer. If you are on the selling side of things, you have, or you have duties and responsibilities to the seller, you represent them in some way, keep in mind that you will need to provide them an estimate of cost based on this offer that they are about to receive. So you may have done a net sheet for them when you listed the property, you need to do a new net sheet for them based on the offer that they are about to receive. So we're gonna to go to page one of the contract. Now in page one of the contract, let me get rid of this. So in page one of the contract, you're gonna notice that across the top of the page, it says property address. So you're always going to write in the property address here, if you're using an, um, an autofill site, just make sure that it's putting the address of the property at the top of each um, individual page. Now, everything on the left, if you read what the contract document says, the contract is going to be defined as this document, which includes six pages, with the following attachments. So if they're using conventional financing, FHA, VA, or doing some type of seller financing, you will be attaching that in addition to these six pages. So you're gonna notice that this spot right here is blank. So this gives you an opportunity to write in items that may not be um, autofilled for you, such as a HUD 184, which is also known as the Native American loan. If the buyer is using USDA financing, that might be something you write in. Or if your buyer is using a 1031 tax exchange, you would need to write that information in. If your buyer is using cash to purchase the transaction, there is no need for you to write the word cash because essentially you would need to be attaching the cash to this um, contract document. If you go down to paragraph two, you'll read in this and it's in bold or capitalization. This is a cash transaction unless a finance supplement is attached. So all, all contracts are considered cash unless you tell me otherwise. Okay, let's talk about this side of the contract. Here we see single family homeowners association. 
If the property has an HOA and your buyer wants an opportunity to review the CCNRs um, or condo or townhouse, uh, similar to that, if there are any CCNRs that go along with that, then you need to check mark what they would like to review and then attach the documentation that says that you would like for those items to be provided to your buyer. As we get into the contract, you do not leave the seller's name blank. You need to go to the tax records and see whose name is on the tax records or um, owner of record. So let's say you look up these tax records and it says Peggy Wright. You're not sure if I still own the property or not. You could put Peggy Wright or owner of record. Now, the next line, you're going to have your buyer's name. Please ask your buyers their legal name or their legal spelling. What you have been calling them up until this point may not be their legal name. They may need to add a middle initial. They may need to add a junior or a senior or a third or something after a name. So just ask questions before you fill that in. Now, all of the information that you see below the buyer's name indicates that in Oklahoma, we do allow electronic signing on our contracts. And if we have two counterparts that are identical, they can be put together to form one contract. The most important paragraph or the most important, excuse me, sentence that you're gonna see in this section is right here. All prior verbal or written negotiations, representations and agreements are superseded by this contract. So if you're looking on the MLS and the MLS indicates that the seller will be leaving a washer, dryer and refrigerator, but you don't put it in this contract, the seller is not contractually obligated to include the washer, dryer and refrigerator. If you will notice at the bottom of your MLS sheets, it will say all information to be verified. So you need to make sure that if your buyer wants something, it appears in this contract because if it doesn't, there's no obligation for the seller to follow through with that. Other, the, the next part that I want to talk about is the county. You can find the county information on the tax records where you looked up the owner of the property's name. So just insert what county the property is located in. And you will also get the legal description from those tax records also. If the legal description is too long, then I would like for you to write C attached supplement, check mark that box at the top, and then attach a blank addendum or supplement indicating the entire length of the legal description. You will write the physical address in here. If the property is a brand new build, um, it, you're going to actually use a different contract. Uh, so if you're looking at it and, you're, and you notice that it doesn't have a physical address, then um, it could be land if you're writing in a land, but that is a separate contract. So you need to stop here and go to the appropriate uh, land contract for that. Now the seller is going to be leaving all the fixtures and improvements, which just means anything that is attached to that. It will, you'll notice in bold print, include mineral rights that are owned by the seller, unless those uh, mineral rights have been previously reserved. Going to paragraph two, we're gonna talk about the purchase price, earnest money and source of funds. The amount that you put here in the purchase price needs to be what the buyer is wanting to offer on the property. Before you allow a buyer to select an amount that they want to place here, please do a market analysis to find out what the fair market value is so that you can better advise your clients. They can, also, they can always offer over the asking price if they choose to, but you need to make sure that you're informing them of whether that is a good decision because you do not want to run into appraisal problems later. So purchase, uh, the advertised price may not always be the fair market value price. Now we are going to talk about the earnest money. A good rule of thumb is to have 1% of whatever the purchase price is as earnest money. So if it's a $150,000 house, your buyer may be putting up $1,500 worth of earnest money. Now, this is just a rule of thumb. Keep in mind that buyers and sellers can always agree to earnest money. They could agree to zero earnest money if they chose. Uh, they could agree to more, they can agree to less. So that is between the buyer and the seller, but this is a good place to start. 
Now, once your buyer has an accepted contract, because today you're just writing an offer. If the sellers were to accept your offer, your buyer is going to have three days to get that earnest money to you. So because you're going to have to get that earnest money deposited into wherever you write in here. If you were to leave that blank, you need to get that earnest money delivered to the listing agent within three days of going under contract. If that earnest money is going to be held at a title company or in your own company's escrow, again, you got three days to make that happen. So now keep in mind that the seller can terminate this contract for failure to deliver the earnest money and that Saturdays, Sundays, or legal holidays do not count as part of the three days. So if Friday is day one, Monday would be, be day two, Tuesday would be day three. Now, failure to deliver earnest money does not mean that you do not have a valid contract. It only gives your seller the ability to sue the buyer for breach of contract. So do not let your buyer say, well, if I don't deliver the earnest money, then we're not officially under contract because that is not true. Let's talk about closing funding and possession in paragraph three. Closing funding and possession is going to either happen on the day that you write in the uh, blank here, or it can always happen before. You can always close early without additional paperwork. You cannot close late. So how long should you expect for a closing to take? Typically, it's going to be 30 to 45 days after uh, the buyers and the sellers have agreed to a uh, contract. So Conventional and FHA loans can take um, about 30 days. If you're working on a VA, just a good rule of thumb is to go ahead and give it the whole 45 days. They, they tend to take a little bit longer because the pool of a VA appraisal appraisers um, is smaller. Now, also in this closing fund and funding and possession category, this paragraph, it talks about what the buyer is going to pay for and what the seller is going to pay for. So, but it talks about the buyer or the seller, if they need to bring money to closing, it can be cash, cashier's check, cashier's check or wire transfer. Now we do have on our contract that it can be cash because it is the legal tender of the United States, but I will let you know that the title company will not receive large sums of cash due to the Patriot Act. So your buyers either need to bring a cashier's check or do a wire transfer preferably. Moving to page two, please make sure the property address is at the top. Now let's talk about this entire section on number four. Everything that's bullet pointed here in paragraph four should stay with the property unless it's been excluded and it will be at no additional cost to the buyer. So you do want to pause just a moment and have your buyer kind of look through this. Now, it would be recommended that when you're showing the property and your buyer has uh, shown some interest that they may want to make an offer on this house, I would have them walk around the house and specifically ask, if you were to make an offer on this property, is there anything that you want the buyer to for sure leave? Or is there anything that you want to make sure that the buyer takes with, or excuse me, the seller takes with them? Now, items that we run into difficulty with often the brackets on flat screen TVs, ring doorbells, the speakers for surround sound, hot tubs, children's play equipment. So anything that your buyer says, wow, I hope they leave that with them and they want to ask for it, then you need to make sure that you are writing it in. Now, here where the arrow is pointing, it says swimming pool, spa equipment and accessories. I do want to point out that does not mean the pool loungers. The accessories are only items that are needed to clean the pool, not ones that you're going to enjoy the pool with. If your buyer wants to make to guarantee that something stays with the house, you need to put it here underneath additional inclusions. If your buyer wants to guarantee, guarantee that the sellers take something with them, then you need to write it here on 4B. As we move into paragraph five, paragraph five is one of the most important paragraphs in the entire contract because it does two things. If you look at paragraph five, it says time periods specified in the contract, time periods for investigations and inspections and reviews, and 
the financing supplement will all begin on. So if you write a date in here, so, and you get an accepted contract, your time reference date will begin one day after. If you choose to leave it blank, then the time reference day will be the third day after the last date of signatures. So this can be really important if you write a date in here and you go back and forth a couple of times or for a couple of days before you get a finalized contract, your buyer may be losing days if you forget to change that uh, date that you have put on the blank. If you leave that blank, which I do recommend that you leave it blank, your time reference date will begin on the third day. So let's say you were to go under contract on the first, your time reference date would not start until the third, and then it would go for however many days that you stay in paragraph seven. Now, paragraph six talks about those property disclosures that you were required to show to your client. They've looked at them, they've reviewed them, they've accepted them, and they've done so by signing the bottom of them. A real estate licensee has no duty to the seller or buyer to conduct an independent inspection of the property, okay? They will not be reviewing the accuracy. You need to make sure that your buyers understand you hold a real estate license, you're not Superman, you do not have x-ray vision. So they will need to hire a home inspector to review the property to find out all of the things that you might not be able to see on a visual inspection just walking through the house. Now, under our paragraph seven for investigations and inspections and reviews, inspections and reviews, you're going to have a number of days in which your buyer has the right to do any inspection that they choose to have done. So the default on this contract is 10 days. So typically you're gonna need 10 to 12 days Keep in mind that sellers are going to have their house off the market during this time. Our contracts are super buyer friendly. If the buyer decided that they did not want to complete this purchase because they found something that they did not like, they could cancel the contract. So just be aware that you don't want a seller to have their house off the market 15, 20 days, losing time of finding other buyers if your buyer decides to back out of this contract. Be courteous of that. Now, Seller will have the water, gas, and electricity turned on and serving the property for the buyer's inspections, but keep in mind you as the buying agent need to verify that information with the listing agent because sometimes buyers like to have things turned off and they forget to tell us about that. So just check and have them verify that everything's going to be on for your inspection period. Buyers uh, can have anyone that they deem qualified do the home inspection on the property. So if they want to have their dad do the inspection, that's perfectly fine. It is recommended that they have a professional uh, home inspection company who's licensed and bonded. If they want to do their own inspections or they want to have a family member do the inspections, I probably would have them to cover yourself, uh, have them sign documentation saying that you recommended a professional home inspection. And then that person may not climb on the roof, go underneath the house, pull off the electric um, uh, uh, panel uh, due to liability. Now your buyers have lots of different things that they can check. Uh, some of them being disclosed here in this contract. So most important is Megan's Law. That's our sex offender registry list. They can Google Oklahoma sex offender, uh, sex offender registry and pull up pages and pages of resources where they can check if this is a concern. You as a real estate agent should not be doing this search for them due to liability if you were to miss uh, a sex offender in the neighborhood. The other uh, really important inspection that I recommend that you have done is to have the roof inspected. If there is any concern, uh, call the insurance company to send someone out. If they cannot get someone out during your inspection period, call an independent uh, roof, roofing company and get their opinion on the uh, roof because not being able to get insurance may not keep them from being uh, the obligation of going through with the purchase later. Now, Again, property address at the top. Your uh, things that you can have during inspections, things that you can inspect for is continued on the next page. So how you're gonna use the property. 
If they have concerns about that, make sure that they're reviewing the covenants, codes, and restrictions during this time, especially if they want to build something on it. If they are wanting to put a pool in, it's going to be very important you contact the listing agent and get the prior survey so they can see where the easements lay on this property. And then uh, square footage. If it's important to them that it be that exact square footage, they need to have it measured during this time. So now that your buyers have had an opportunity to inspect the property, so we're going to talk about termites and other wood destroying organisms. So our contract in paragraph C1 just says that if termites or other wood destroying insects are found, that the seller would only have to treat the residential structure. That does not include detached garages or fences. If you want them to be required to treat at all, you need to put that into uh, paragraph 13, seller to treat for termites or other wood destroying organisms if found during inspections. Because right now it just says uh, that if you find them, they're there. There's no obligation for the seller to actually treat. And then if he does, he only has to treat the residents. Let's talk about the inspections themselves. The inspection period will end. So if you had a 10 day inspection that started on the third and it ends on the 13th, you now have 24 hours after it expires to deliver to the seller all copies of all written reports obtained by the buyer. So let's say my inspection ends on the 13th. I will have until the 14th to turn over home inspection reports, termite inspection reports, structural engineer reports if I had them. Even though the buyer pays for them, when they signed this contract, they agreed to give the seller all written report copies. So make sure you're getting that over. Now, once uh, their inspection period has ended, the buyer has to make a decision. They're gonna choose one or the other path. If they choose A, it just means that they have found the inspections to be unsatisfactory and they are going to cancel the contract. This cannot be done by picking up the phone and calling the listing agent and saying, sorry, my buyers didn't like this part of the house and they're gonna cancel the contract. In real estate, everything's in writing. So you need to find the document that says written notice of cancellation and you're going to check mark box one of that document that says that the inspections were unsatisfactory. That is your reason for cancellation. There's another document uh, to fill out in order to get your buyer's earnest money back. But, and in short, if you don't fill out the written notice of cancellation, then it's not officially canceled. Your buyers are still moving towards closing. If your buyers, um, it, and that would be page 17 if you're in my class. If your buyers decide that they do want to move forward with the purchase, but there are some things that they would like to have uh, repaired or would like to ask the seller to repair, keep in mind sellers do not have to make any repairs on this property at all. So doing so is at their own discretion. But if your buyers want to ask for particular repairs on the property, they need to fill out the document that's called a treatment repair and replacement form or TRR for short. Do not fill out the TRR until your buyer has exhausted every single inspection that they want to do within their time frame. There's no do overs. So you submit it and you're done. Now, keep in mind, do not put things on your TRR that are decorative. They want them to paint the wall that's decorative. So I want you to install a doorbell. Well, the house didn't have a doorbell. So all of those things are considered decorative. You can only put items on the TRR that are broken. You installed them for this purpose and they do not work for that anymore, such as a dishwasher. So it is a good idea to prep your buyers ahead of time before inspections are even done that you're going to get a giant report and 99% of the items that are on it will not matter. We're looking for the major components, roof, air, HVAC system, hot water tank, plumbing, electric issues. Now keep in mind that your TRR is not a wish list. It is intended for items that are broken and that would have a materially adverse effect on the property. They would make the house less valuable if, the, if they were not corrected. 
Now, once your buyer submits their TRR to the seller, and we move to this paragraph I that's right below that, buyer and the seller are gonna have seven days to negotiate out any repairs. So your buyer might submit 10 items, the seller agrees to fix nine of them, everybody's in agreement, then those repairs will be done prior to closing. If for some reason the buyer and the seller can't get it negotiated out on the repairs, this contract, if you read the last paragraph here, so if a written agreement is not reached within the time uh, specified in this provision, contract will terminate, buyer's earnest money will be returned. Now, when does the buyer not get to cancel the contract? They will not get to cancel the contract if they fail to do one of these things during their time frame. Remember, time is of the essence. If they do not do inspections, they don't get to cancel the contract after their inspection period is over. It can't be three weeks into it. Oh, I forgot to do inspections. Now I wanna cancel the contract. Too bad, you're moving towards closing. If they can't get a loan based on the in a, um, unavailability of hazard insurance, you can get insurance. You just may not like the price that you're paying for it now. So if that payment is important to them, they need to make sure they're contacting their insurance company during their inspection period. And then if the square footage were to come back different during an appraisal, as long as the house appraises, even though the square footage may be different, they're still obligated to uh, continue that purchase. If square footage is important to them, make sure that they're measuring during their inspection period. Now let's talk about the final walkthrough because that is also super important. I do not recommend doing your final walkthrough an hour, 30 minutes or an hour before closing because if you get there and all of those items are not completed, you're gonna have a problem. So you're going to take your TRR that has been agreed upon by the seller to your final walkthrough because you're going to make sure that those items were actually done. Now keep in mind the seller can attend this walkthrough if they choose to. If your buyer wants to hire a company uh, to do their uh, reinspection, they can do that. All inspections and reinspections will be paid for by the buyer. On your TRR list, please do not put seller to hire a structural engineer to evaluate the foundation. That's an inspection. Buyers are supposed to pay for all inspections. If you want the foundation uh, corrected, that's what goes on a TRR. This risk of loss se uh, section, seller's insurance will cover the property until the time of close, and then the buyer's insurance covers it after the transfer of title. When we get into acceptance of the property, it is super important that whatever condition the property is in, when you do your walkthrough, your buyer needs to decide if they're willing to accept the property. If you go over and you have 10 things on a TRR and your seller has uh, completed nine of them, but not the 10th one, then you need to ask your buyer, are you willing to purchase this property if number 10 never gets done? If the answer to that is no, you need to call the title company and let them know that you will be pushing the closing until the repairs are done because the contract has not been completed. Um, if the answer is yes, keep in mind, it, even if the seller says, I will send somebody over after closing to correct that problem. Uh, according to the red underline here, no warranties expressed or implied by the seller, the broker, or any other associate, um, associated licensees with reference to the condition of the property will survive the closing. So it may be that that plumber never shows up and your buyers need to be okay with that. As we move to paragraph four, property address, again, make sure you're writing the address at the top and let's talk about title evidence. You're going to choose one of these. If you are getting a loan, the lender is going to require their own title insurance policy. So if you're getting a loan and the buyers opt not to get title insurance, they are only going to save themselves around $50 because they will pay for the entire coverage for the seller, or excuse me, for the lender on their behalf. So choose one of these. Uh, title commitment insurance, title insurance is a one-time policy 
that they will pay that covers the property against defects that have happened in the past. Every single time that a property changes hands, the abstract is brought up to date by an attorney. So if you choose not to get title insurance, an attorney is still looking at it, but if he makes a mistake, if he didn't catch something during that time, then there's no recourse for that. They will be paying to clear up that title on the, um, uh, on the abstract on their own. Now, keep in mind that most defects that title insurance covers uh, deal with forgery and attorneys may not be knowledgeable that that was a for forged instrument until somebody complains later. Let's go down and talk about paragraph 10C, your land or boundary survey. Now a Penn stake survey can be pretty expensive, uh, $1,700 on up, the further out in the country, the more expensive they seem to be. This is where the surveyor is going to come and drop the metal pens at the corners and he will flag the boundaries of the property using uh, surveying equipment. A mortgage inspection is a little bit different. Mortgage inspections tend to cost around $200, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more. And the mortgage inspection is simply going to tell the lender or the borrower where the property sits um, on the parcel of land. So are there any fences? Are there any outbuildings? Do you cover any easements? You are not required to get either of these if you're paying cash, but if you are getting a loan, the lender is always going to want a mortgage inspection report. And that is a buyer's expense. Our title evidence section just says that the title commitment will be uh, available to the buyer 10 days prior to closing. The title commitment will involve things that need to be uh, cleared before the property can transfer from the current owner to the buyer, but it also describes the easements and who will have access to those easements. Buyers have 10 days to review that information. Now the title commitment is likely going to be sent to you as the real estate agent to review, and then you're going to forward that on to the buyer. So please make sure that you are getting that taken care of uh, prior to closing. Now, as we move into issues that could come up with the title, we get down into this section where it talks about there being a delayed closing date. If there were to be a cloud on the title, if there was something that could not get cleared up that would allow the current owner to transfer a property to the new uh, buyer, then this is at default going to be 30 day extension to your contract. So if you thought you were closing on November the 30th and something was found on title, it could potentially extend this contract automatically with no other paperwork needed for 30 days. If your buyers cannot extend this contract due to rate locks that are going to be expensive for them, or they're using a 1031 exchange program, then you need to write uh, the, the number zero in here. If there is a cloud on the title, you do not have to use the entire 30 days. Uh, once the cloud is cleared up, then all parties must be ready to close within five days of the cure. As we move into paragraph 11, the only thing I wanna point out here, ad valorem taxes, fancy way of saying property taxes, the seller, the current seller, will give the buyer a credit at closing from January 1st through the date of closing. But keep in mind that it will be based on the previous year's uh, assessment ratio. So if you look at the uh, if you look at the taxes and you notice that they're zero or they're unusually low, it could be indica indicative of that that is a disabled veteran or the uh, property taxes have been frozen due to the owner's age. They are an elderly person. It will not be that way for your buyer if they do not qualify under one of those categories. It will reassess at the current uh, rate. So check on that before if there's concerns about payment because that will definitely impact your buyer's payment if they have a loan. 
All of these things must be paid for by the seller. They're going to pay their own dock stamps, but they're also going to pay any outstanding uh, utility bills, any labor uh, mechanic things that could cause mechanics liens on the property. And then if your client happens to be purchasing a property that has a tenant in it and they are inheriting that tenant due to the length of the lease, make sure that security deposits are brought to closing in the form of a cashier's check. They will be transferred to the buyer at closing. Page five, again, property address at the top. Let's talk about paragraph 12, which is, it says residential service agreement, but it's also known as a home warranty. Now you notice that you have three boxes underneath section 12, A, B, and C. So if your buyer does not want a home warranty, they're not asking for a home warranty, you're going to check mark A. If the MLS says that the current sellers will provide a home warranty to the buyer and you want to make sure that that indeed happens at closing, check mark B. So seller currently has a residential service agreement in effect and it shall transfer uh, the agreement for one year to the buyer at closing. Now in paragraph C, the uh, sellers are not currently offering a home warranty, but your buyer wants one. Property or home warranties can, uh, there's a pretty, pretty broad spectrum of what they cover and how much they cost. Typically, they're going to be somewhere between four and eight hundred dollars. But keep in mind that is going to vary if they're just covering the house, maybe closer to four hundred. If it's the house and the pool and the well house and any septic lines, it's going to continue to get more expensive. On this side of things, your buyer has indicated that they want a home warranty. How much of that do they want the seller to cover? So it can be some of it, half of it, all of it, but you need to write the dollar amount in here. Paragraph 13 is where we talked about if you want the sellers to treat for termites, it needs to be physically written in here. Seller to treat for termites or other wood destroying organisms if found during inspections. Without that phrase, there is no obligation. When your buyers and sellers agree to this contract, they agree to mediate before they take each other to small claims court if disputes come up during, uh, during this contract. So mediation first, small claims court later. And then keep in mind the time is of the essence in this contract means that all dates have to be followed. There's no, there's no leeway on that. It must be done by the dates that are indicated in the contract. So what happens if the uh, seller breaches this contract? If the buyer has done everything that they're supposed to do according to this uh, contract and the seller is the reason that this contract may not close, they have failed to uh, follow through, maybe they haven't completed all of the TRR requirements, then the buyer has a couple of choices. They can cancel the contract and um, terminate the contract and get their earnest money back, or they can uh, seek any remedy available at law, which would include a specific performance, which would mean that the judge would force the sellers to go through with this contract. What happens if the shoe is on the other foot, the seller has done every single thing that they're supposed to, and the buyer is in breach of this contract. Maybe the buyer did not deliver the earnest money in the three day time frame, So, or they didn't perform some other type of obligation. So seller can uh, cancel this contract, just like the buyer, seller has performed their obligations. Um, let's back that up for just a minute. And they can either keep or attempt to keep the buyer's earnest money um, up to 5% of the purchase price as liquidated damages, or they can also seek any remedy available at law, including specific performance. But keep in mind, they have to choose one, buyers and sellers. So because of this word or, if you cancel the contract, then you will not be suing the buyer or the seller in court. So choose to do one, either cancel it and get your earnest money back and move on. Or if you wanna to go to court, then you do not cancel that contract. And that goes for buyer and seller. Incurred expenses are easy. You order it, you pay for it. So if the seller orders it, they pay for it. If the buyer orders it, 
they pay for it. Now this paragraph can be really important because it talks about how you're gonna get the earnest money back. So do not tell your buyers that they are automatically gonna get their earnest money back because it can be a process. Ideally, you use uh, 16B1, which just means the buyer and the seller have mutually agreed to who's gonna get the earnest money back. Everybody's signed the documentation accordingly and the earnest money is returned. Now, if for some reason that did not happen because occasionally you have buyers and the sellers who feel like they should be owed the earnest money, uh, you can go to mediation. If mediation is not successful, then you're going to go to interpleader court, which is also known as small claims court. If one, two, and three doesn't happen, but the earnest money is sitting in the brokerage um, account, then 30 days after the term, final termination of the contract, the broker of the uh, brokerage, the managing broker of the brokerage can send out certified mail to both the buyer and the seller, um, indicating that within 15 days, if they don't hear from either party, they're going to release to the party that they have chosen. So if they do hear back from the buyer or seller saying that, that is not what they want to happen, then they would deposit it with the court and let the judge decide. Now, as we get to page six of six, again, property address at the top, this non-foreign seller statement only deals with properties that are over 300,000. It is a special tax for people that are not citizens of the United States uh, when they sell. Now, typically title companies are going to take care of this uh, for us, but you do want to check with the title company and make sure that they have um, checked on this. Please do not leave this spot blank. Don't forget to put an offer date, um, an offer end date on this because you don't want the sellers to be able to come back six months from now once your buyers already purchased a different house and say, oh yeah, we'll take your contract because you may have a legal problem there. This spot where when you make an offer, offer rejected and the seller's not going to make a counter offer. We cannot force sellers to sign this. If there is no answer, no answer is an answer. So we can ask the sellers to sign this. We cannot force the sellers to sign this. Buyers will always sign this contract. Sellers will not sign this contract if they, if they make a counter offer because they're not agreeing to these terms. So don't let your seller, if you're on the listing side, sign here if they choose to make a counter offer. Now I wanna briefly talk about these two documents here. Your buyer had a property to sell and they cannot purchase another house unless they have this home sold. So these two documents protect your buyer from being required to complete a purchase if their house didn't sell. If your buyer has their house and it is currently under contract, this is the paper that's on the left, you're going to submit that, that contract, your six page contract. You're also going to submit this piece of paper along with, and notice in red, a copy of the contract on their home. You have to be able to prove that you do have a bona fide contract um, accepted on the property that they're selling. If that's not the case, maybe your buyers have just now decided that they want to sell. Um, they do need to sell their house in order to buy another house. You're going to use the document that's on the right, which says seller's property condition is not under contract right now. Now you're going to choose on number two, you're going to choose one. Either they already have it listed and it's just not under contract yet, or they're going to put it on the market. If they choose to put it on the market, they have two days. I do want to back up for just a minute on this. Keep in mind that paragraph three says, if your house is not under contract, the seller gets to continue to market the property. Because what the seller is trying to do is attract a buyer who does not have a house, does not have a house that needs to be sold. So once your buyer has sold their house, then this, this doesn't, um, come into play anymore. But if you're on the listing side of things, even though the contract that the buyer and the seller agreed to says that the seller's property will remain on the market, our new MLS rules require that the property be marked pending with a special condition of accepting uh, backups. You can still hold open houses or do um, any other type of marketing that you choose to, but you do have to mark it pending in the MLS. 
Okay, I wanna back up. Our inspection period said that we were doing two things. It one, decided how long we had, uh, when our inspection period would start, but it also said that it started the clock on our finance supplement too. So what did that mean? We're not gonna go over every single finance page because they all have this one particular phrase in it, every single one of them. And it's right here where the red arrow is pointing. Within five days of that time reference date, your buyer has to get in and make application for the loan. They're gonna get all the documents into the lender that they're asking for. And then they are also going to pay the initial loan fees and they're gonna pay for the property appraisal and credit report. So listing agents, five days go by, you have the right to call the buyer's lender and ask, did they get in and pay for the appraisal? Has the appraisal been ordered? It doesn't mean that the appraisal will be done in five days. It just means it must have been ordered. So it's very important that you pay a close attention to that time reference date because it starts the clock on these five days. You will see that for the conventional, the FHA, uh, VA, USDA, and the Native American contracts. So that is all of the information that we have on a residential property um, contract. So, but if you have any questions as your broker, please don't hesitate to call email or text me if you have questions concerning this particular contract. Thank you for attending.